Hey guys, as mentioned, whoa, sorry. As mentioned, I'm Mike, um, and we are here to talk about the future of life on this planet with artificial intelligence. Um, so some of you may uh, remember that the Future of Life Institute has been, uh, has been rabble-rousing about the existential, th existential threat, i.e. we're all going to die, from artificial general intelligence. And you probably remember that from a letter about three months ago that was signed by all your big names, your Gates, your Hawking, your uh, Musk, those kind of guys. Um, and that letter was actually a fairly simple premise. It was, hey guys, let's not do the artificial intelligences directly connecting nukes, uh, anything that's uh, anything's gonna kill people. So lots of people, lots of people did it. There's still some pushback from the military saying, no, no, we absolutely must do that. But for the most people said, yeah, you know what? That does actually seem like a good idea. Let's not just kill ourselves by someone making a little mistake in how the AI runs. So let's go ahead and just start building an AGI. Um, we all understand that AGIs are probably going to cause a huge cataclysmic change to our societies. Um, it's probably going to drive unemployment through the roof, all sorts of social ills. Everyone will hate us. But you know what? That's actually sort of the idea. The idea of soft AI is, and the reason everyone's working for it so hard right now, is the idea that AI will take over all of the drudge work, and it will rewrite all of the fields of endeavor that we work in. Um, the moral implications don't really come up very often. Oh, whoops, sorry, I was a little impatient there. So there is a huge upside to this, right? All of the big corporations, your Googles, your Facebooks, your Baidus, all the rest, they're all racing to try and implement something like an artificial general intelligence. And probably everyone in this room over the next few decades is going to be working on artificial intelligence, machine learning, integrating all of this stuff into almost every process that we work on. So the thing is that the, the, um, the, uh, the uh, Future of Life Institute is worried more fundamentally about a deeper risk than just hooking things up to, up to weapons. They're more, they're more worried about the threat of artificial general super intelligence. That is creating something which is far more intelligent than ourselves, which is able to reprogram itself and change its very nature faster than we can adapt to its, to its, um, its, uh, migra its evolution. And particularly that what comes out of that process is not going to be what they call value aligned, which is to say it won't care what we think, what we want. It won't care about our lives, about our worries for what, this, for what we want to be. Um, now, the, the argument for why we see superintelligence from artificial general intelligence is mostly due to the efficiency of the machine, the ability to run constantly, the ability to rewire itself when it learns a more efficient or optimal way of constructing itself. Um, and the problem is once something becomes superintelligent, it becomes impossible for us to predict what it would do. And that's just the nature of greater intelligence. We can't predict what something is going to do if we are less intelligent than it. We can recognize that it does seem to act as though it is more intelligent, but we can't necessarily say what it would do. Um, and the problem is that people like the, the Future of Life Institute and the rest, um, they're worried that it's basically going to wipe us out. Um, and really, that doesn't seem like a very likely scenario. Most of the scenarios where an artificial general intelligence wakes up don't involve it going, oh, hey, I'm fearful, I'm whatever. They don't have those kind of needs built in. But we can't currently assure someone that it won't. Right? We don't currently have that ability philosophically to say, we know that an artificial general intelligence that becomes super intelligent will not kill us. It doesn't seem likely, but we don't know that. So 
To assure people, we can take lots of strategies, but probably the first strategy and the, the most straightforward one is to say, artificial general intelligence is impossible. Anyone who says it is, is an idiot. And you know what? You can just walk away from the problem. Um, so if it's not possible, then there's no problem, right? We move on to the next problem. And the philosophers who are currently pushing this forward are, um, uh, there's a guy, a guy named Searle. You can read the details of the Chinese room. It's not really all that important. It's essentially arguing against the Turing test being implementable in a von Neumann architecture. Um, and from this, a lot of philosophers have come up with the idea that without embodiment, without a physical body that has needs, that has desires, that has senses that assign value to things, then you can't produce a, a thinking thing that we would recognize as a thinking thing. Um, and one of the problems that comes up from Searle's argument is he describes a book that has rules that transform all language to all language that somehow passes the Turing test. That book, if it were not the size of the universe, would, would be intelligent. Um, and we could also argue, sorry, the other way we could, or another way we could argue, is to say it's not technically feasible to build a brain. Um, a brain has around 10 to the 14th, 10 to the 15th synapses, has a couple of petabytes of storage. Um, the futurists love to say, well, if Moore's Law is going to go forever. We're eventually going to get there. Um, with our current approach, it would take about uh, 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 1.5 million machines, every one of those machines consuming about 1,000 watts of power just to simulate a single brain of about our intelligence. Um, unfortunately, that argument about it leaves aside the fact that we, like, we might find an algorithm that is far more efficient, because after all, we have one running here, right? So where are we on the road to artificial intelligence, or artificial general intelligence? Um, we all know, because of course you're in this room, that there's been many advances in the past few years. In particular, there's been a huge amount of advance in pattern recognition. Deep learning, all the various neural networks that we're all deploying, they're all, well, sorry, most of them are pretty much focused on detecting patterns in unstructured data and mostly applying labels to them. We have another set of approaches that is going from the high end, which is doing essentially symbolic manipulation. These are things like thought vectors and the like, and addition and subtraction of thought vectors. Um, and those two facilities are a big part of intelligence. They're, they are actually a significant part of intelligence. But there are a lot of facilities of the mind that as of yet we do not have. And this isn't to say that they're impossible or necessarily even hard, but we don't currently have proof that they are going to happen. Um, the first of those is compression and simplification. This is abstract, abstract thought, if you want to think of it. This is finding a model of the universe, bringing it down to its essence so that we can then apply further models to it. Um, this is the formation of new ideas, conceptualization. Um, Le Chun from Facebook just did a nice little talk on that being the next, the next thing to deal with. Uh, also transfer learning. This is something that all, all kids basically learn to do. This is where we learn something while from walking down a street, and we're able to apply it to the mathematical problem that we're trying to deal with that day. Prioritization. This is where we are able to say, this is the most important information for me to know. And if I can do this, then I can figure out what it was that I needed to know. And this requires some epistemic knowledge that we don't currently build into neural networks, where we understand what is unknown, and we have hypotheses going forward. Um, and a big one in terms of efficiency is the use of prediction. Human beings don't see. We expect and then confirm that we saw what we saw. Um, this is how most of, your, most of your visual illusions and the like work. We also don't have a universal drive. We don't have something which will drive an artificial intelligence to learn to become super intelligent. Right? Um, we are driven by 
our animal nature to, to avoid pain, to find pleasure, to do all sorts of things. And once we have all of that, now we can start looking at kind of broader issues that aren't necessarily required for an artificial, gen an artificial intelligence, but are more artificial general intelligence. This is things like common sense. This is things where our shared experience lets us filter out solutions that wouldn't make any real sense but we don't currently have that modeling in a neural network. We don't also have, oh sorry, the, yeah, missed one. Um, we don't have the, that integration of uncertainty as to, I am perfectly sure of this, this I am somewhat unsure of and could be convinced, that is just an idea. We don't have that hierarchy yet building into the neural networks. Um, Self-awareness is a contentious one. Lots of people say self-awareness is just anthropocentric bias. It has absolutely nothing to do with intelligence. Um, philosophers tend to like their Descartes, but that's life. Um, the other idea that comes with self-awareness is the idea that it's possible the animal, our hindbrain, is the observer of the operations of the higher brain. Once we get to that, we're, we're getting into more uh, really more anthropocentric ideas, socialization, being able to recognize that other people have minds, maybe potentially having rights, desires, that kind of thing. Um, again, things that we all learn when we're kids. Sorry, my slides are getting ahead of me there. Um, and then being interested in what that other person thing is, is thinking. Um, sanity and robustness is more a question of a grounding of, again, it's an epistemic question of grounding. I know these things to be true. And so if you present to me something which does not make sense, then I guess that this is probably going to be true and that is not. And so I don't go off into the cornfields looking at something that doesn't make any sense. Um, so there is a lot missing there. The, I mean, if we want, we can just tell the, the Future of Life Institute you know what, we're a long, long way away and you know, we'll work on it. And that's just to get to an artificial general intelligence, not necessarily an artificial general super intelligence. So the, the general consensus among AI researchers that were, that were interviewed by the FLI was somewhere 25 to 85 years for an artificial general intelligence, right? We're getting off into distances of time where we have almost no influence on, right? So why are these FLI guys still worried? Why are they now ag agitating about this? The basic problem is that programmers suck, right? 99% um, of what you and I and everyone else in this room does is best effort crap. Well, so pardon my French, but it, uh, it's not the kind of stuff that people want building a brain especially one that might control the world. Um, so the problem is society wants all of artificial general intelligence, but they want it to be at almost no cost. They want it to fit that model where, you know, we're going we're gonna to pay our web dev a couple cents and he's going to throw up a PHP site and who cares if it's got a little, uh, you know, little vulnerability in it. And society really isn't interested in paying this price for artificial and machine language research. And, I mean, who can blame them? We are probably not going to get there for 25 years. What does it matter? Right? Unfortunately, we're also fearful animals. And we are worried that if there is an artificial general super intelligence that comes about because of a very rapid advance, we worry that it's going to smite us. Um, and a lot of that is projecting our fears onto it. It's projecting animal nature onto something that isn't an animal. But we can't actually assure people of that. We can't guarantee them that there is no danger from this. So somehow, the Freedom of Life Institute and aligned parties would like us to fix this problem. They'd like us to install something which will keep this super intelligent thing that we're going to spend 25 years or whatever 
building away from everyone, away from anything that could kill us. Um, and a lot of the proposals are really kind of naive, like you know, we'll have research rules and you know, programmers will have to be registered or whatever. But if we truly have a super intelligence, if it is truly something far more intelligent than us, and, and again, this is a big pause, but and it really wants out, and we've locked it up in that bottle, right? we're not gonna like the result of that. And the FLI's idea that we're somehow going to have saved ourselves seems like it might backfire a little. Um, the thing is, we have no idea whether an artificial general intelligence that does not have a self, needs, that, that doesn't have any of our animal nature, would actually care about being restricted. And if it doesn't, then, then there's no problem, right? So maybe we can look at restricting self to avoid all of these issues, right? Maybe we develop guidelines that say, you know what? You cannot introduce a need-based system into a, an artificial intelligence. And that's not going to work. And we all know that's not going to work because anyone can learn to program when they're six years old and can keep working and working, and they don't need to ever talk to anyone. They can read books, and I mean, it's not a realistic scenario to try and use that. Any technological prevention me measure, like anything we try to do, just is gonna fall by the way wayside. However, it's possible, and again, we don't know this, that to have a true general intelligence, you must have a self, and you must have needs, and needs must drive it in order to produce an intelligence. And if that is true, how do, we, how do we train such a thing without trying to restrict it to make it a slave or a, a prisoner, right? And I'd suggest as a starting point, we could look at something like the law and say, this is what we are willing to constrain ourselves with. And maybe we pass some new laws that deal with the differences between us, but that is our first sketch of this is what you need to be if you wish to be part of our society and not subject to war. Um, and that avoids the moral issues of us enslaving another, another being. Um, with regard to slavery, um, we have thorny issues that need to be dealt with once we start talking about an artificial, and artificial general intelligence. Um, there are things such as, do we teach an artificial general intelligence about Ayn Rand's pseudo-philosophy where I am the most important thing and darn you, we're going to do what I want. Um, probably more disturbing, particularly for people from the FLI, is that if you have an AI which is capable of all of this, you also have the ability to have someone uh, sorry, and you're using a technological prevention me mechanism, someone can remove it, right? So it doesn't matter how good your prevention mechanism is. Someone can say, I think this AI should be loosed with the explicit goal of doing something horrible. And we have a lot of talk right now that self-driving cars should be the only cars on the road in a few years, right? The moral choice is that human beings should be restricted from driving cars. And when we hit an artificial general superintelligence, shouldn't it be the artificial super general intelligence that rules us morally? Um, I don't want to say this is the most important thing in the world. I don't think it is. In the next 85 years, the kind of timeline we're looking at here, it is almost guaranteed that any well-funded group can find a nuclear, can find and build a nuclear weapon, right? Climate change is coming up, lots of people will be displaced, disease, famine, war, drought, pestilence, those aren't gone. I know it seems like sometimes they're gone when we're living in North America, but they're not. Social injustice, even here we have lots of it. Um, depletion of energy, resources, uh, lack of exploration. There's lots of stuff that's going on that we as a society need to deal with, right? This is something that we should be able to discuss 
And we should be keeping in mind as we move forward in building artificial intelligences. But it doesn't seem like the most critical issue we need to deal with today. It's something that does need to be addressed, but it doesn't look like it's likely to kill us in the next few years. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Thanks a lot, Mike. OK, so I ran through that so there'd be time for questions and comments. So does anyone have any questions or comments? All right, if you have a question, can you please try and come up to one of the sides of the room, and I'll try and run around with the mic. Um, I know there are a lot of people already in the uh, stairwell on the right here, so if you guys can make room for anyone coming down, that'd be great. Where do you see the morality of uh, AGI developing in the next few years? Because while we may not have the technological pieces in place to build general intelligence, the self-driving cars example you gave is a good one where, mm -hmm. and I've read articles about this, we probably all have, where the car is going to go down the street, it has a decision, all right, do I hit this group of three children or do I save the driver? Yep. That sort of morality will have to be built into the system pretty mm -hmm. soon before we get to that level. What do you think? Uh, well, the, the issue with the trolley problem, which is the which, which, which person do I kill, um, the issue with the tro trolley problem is that's still us debating what the morality is, right? And introducing a decision for the machines. Um, the, the, the morality that we encode is necessarily our morality, right? If the machine is not yet capable of moral reasoning, then it is, by definition, not its morality, right? And the imposition of morality on another is often considered the big moral question. I force you to accept what I see as important. Um, the, most obvious the most obvious forcing there would be my life as a human being is superior to your life as an artificial being, right? And that forcing of morality, and that includes uh, enforcement of restrictions upon all, like all of those things where we enforce upon another, those are all the moral questions that come up. For us coding an AI, that's us making a moral decision about something which cannot itself make a moral decision. Um, so you listed all the, a lot of the gaps that we still have to build in order to get, uh, theoretically, an artificial general intelligence. And you also said that a lot of these powerful corporations are working on that. Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble sort of reconciling those two things. Like among, you know, drive and self-awareness and, and some mm -hmm. of the other stuff you listed, what are the business incentives for a company like whatever, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, to do that? I understand mm -hmm. the business incentives for better pa pattern recognition, ma making mm -hmm. image search work better, but, you know, why, why would a co company like Google or Facebook work on making something self-aware? What's the point for them? Uh, okay, so when, well, there's, there's multiple levels of the things you can get. Um, in terms of, sorry, I'll just, oh, whoops, that doesn't work. Let's try that. Um, when you get down to, oh, sorry, I'll try to go business case for each one, and then we'll all go off and build some, build some companies. Um, <laughs> so uh, for compression and simplification, um, this allows you to build a much more dense network that can deal with a lot of cases that we currently, it simply doesn't work. Um, it's part of how we model the world, like it's part of how we, uh, we structure, oh, I don't know how to turn off the things while I'm doing it, but anyway. Um, it allows for far more uh, structured representations of what's going on, so it lets you build that model of this is actually how that thing works uh, without having to dedicate huge amounts of resources to it. So the compression and simplification basically gives you a far better, simpler, cheaper model for AI. Um, for uh, transfer learning, um, that's that ability to say, like, I've got this piece of thing that I, this piece of knowledge that I've learned over here, that, that pattern, and I want to be able to apply it across my entire, my entire infrastructure of AI. Um, Google, Facebook, and the like, they're not trying to build, you know, 
an AI which does a particular thing. They're, like, they're, they're, research teams are trying to build a general AI which can solve whatever problem you want. Um, if you look at their current work in things like uh, playing games, right? the idea is give it an input and say, OK, try to make that bigger. right? So that, that um, oh, sorry, we went ahead again. Um, that ability to transfer knowledge and patterns would mean faced with one of the games, it could use all of the knowledge that it learned in the past game to optimize its, op its next operation. Um, prioritization, focus, this is an epistemic ability that allows it to deal with uncertainty. Again, when you're trying to build, um, for instance, if you were trying to build something which can build a knowledge graph, in order to understand the inputs that you're getting, you need to be able to model that the the inputs contain uncertainty and be able to, to essentially um, do a falsification upon them to model which pieces, you, which pieces you can trust, which pieces you cannot, and then eventually migrate things to being a, a core understood thing versus some new idea that you've discarded or an idea that's off on the side. Um, prediction is an optimization one. So that's just, it makes it much, much faster for it to do voice dictation, video tagging, all that kind of stuff you want to do. Um, drive, that's what lets you do, it's what basically lets you say, just keep going. Figure it all out so that we can then start querying your database. Um, common sense, I mean, it's fairly obvious. If you can avoid big, uh, big expensive excursions off into things that don't make any sense, fairly useful. So self-awareness was the specific one you were asking about. Um, again, this is, the case is not necessarily that we are going to explore self-awareness, but that it may be an emergent feature of a sufficiently complex network. Um, the other possibility that people describe is that idea that it's actually the animal, exp the animal experience of awareness. And if that's the case, if there's no animal experience of it, there may be no consciousness emergent. But if it is actually a result of a sufficiently complex network with sufficiently deep levels of, of, uh, of uh, interconnection, then it may be that that eventually produces a consciousness itself. So that particular case isn't necessarily that we need it. Um, it's, it may come with the package, as it were. Socialization. Really nice if it doesn't make social gaffes all the time and has some idea of what you want and what, you know. That's that whole personalization of AI stuff that Google and Facebook, they all, I mean, you know, half the stuff they're doing is just, I want to make it more personal for you, so I'm going to pay attention to your signals and try and figure it out. Um, and sanity or robustness, again, that's getting well off into the, they're not even beginning to work on that because we're not at that level of psychology of AIs yet. Um, it's just a, an unsolved problem that when we get up to a certain level, we're going to probably have to have a solution to it. Okay? Did that? Okay. Hi. So um, I just actually completed my PhD in this exact topic, but I come from the uh, philosophy side, um, and which I'm very dissatisfied with because, like you said, cats are catting. Uh, there's too much sort of worrying things. Um, and I recently gave a talk on this, and one question that was asked that I'd love to hear your input on is, there's, so there's the two scenarios of one where we actually design um, some sort of AGI or AGSI, uh, but what about the question of one just waking up? So something from the idea of like, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, Watson 3.0 that just without us knowing, we, sp we spectacularly fail and just wakes up. What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that was actually the idea of the self there, right? So if we discover an algorithm which becomes far more efficient, it is theoretically possible that we could stand one up with no, with no warning, as it were. Um, as I said, our current, our current technology means, I mean, Google has sufficient machines to run something of brain scale sufficient. They can do it. Um, but they, Facebook, uh, Baidu, they're, they're like the only, the only entities as far as I know that currently have one and a half million machines plus. Um, if, we were, like, if we had that scenario where 
Watson 3 or whichever, ver Watson 78, whichever version they finally get to, if we had that happen, we get into exactly the scenario that the Future of Life Institute guys are, are worried about, right? And again, there's a hell of a lot of anthropomorphizing of it, right? There's a hell of a lot of suddenly this thing cares deeply about its freedom, even though it has no real reason to do so, right? It, it doesn't have our innate drives that say we need to be free in order to get food and find mates and do all the other junk we have to do. Um, well, it's a computer, right? I mean, it's got its power delivered. It's pretty much OK. Um, so that those scenarios, they are possible, but they are well out into the, this seems more like you're just projecting yourself onto a machine that has no necessary reason to act in the way you're describing. Um, so, like I say, it's not that it couldn't. It is theoretically possible. Um, in theory, we could get a, one of the uh, planet paperclip scenarios. The, the planet paperclip scenario being we misprogram something, it happens to be insanely devious about carrying out our requirements, and it turns the whole world into paperclips because someone wanted paperclips. Um, it, you know, in theory, that's possible. Um, it is but it is a very low probability thing when we're still talking about million machine, well, even, even Watson scale machines are, they're a non-trivial thing. The fact that the entirety of the human race was unable to stop them pretty much relies on it being nukes. Nukes, actually. That's, I think that's currently the only thing we got. Um, I mean, you know, in theory, nuclear reactors could be blown up or something, but you're talking even there, it's not a global extinction event, which is what the Future of Life Institute's worried about. It's a, wow, that could really hurt a lot of people, but probably not kill us all off. Any more questions? All right, please uh, join me in thanking Mike for the talk.